Hello everyone and welcome to another Stat 437 lecture video. In today's video we're going to be taking a look at another example of fitting a generalized marginal model to some data using the GEE method with the GEE pack GEE GLM R function. So that's what we were doing in the last video. In that video I introduced the package and we sort of spent a lot of time looking at uh, how we might fit those models and comparing them using the QIC and that type of thing. In this video, what I'm going to be doing is looking at a different data set. So in this case, it's going to be some count data. It's a uh, count data about the number of seizures based on a trial that's looking at a drug that's treating epilepsy. And so what we're going to be doing is a similar process here where we're fitting some uh, models using the GEE GLM. But really the focus here is going to be on sort of the scientific questions of inquiry. So in the last video, we were looking at, you know, how can we actually fit the data? How can we manipulate the R objects and that type of thing? In this video, it's going to be far more an application where I have some questions that, you know, we're going to try to answer and we're going to sort of walk through the process of doing that. So uh, if you haven't seen that video, check it out. Of course, the code and the data for this are posted on the course website. And so with that, I'll open up R over here and we can take a look at these data. So uh, the first thing, again, we're using the GEE pack library. You've probably saw this uh, in the last video, so we can uh, take a look at that. If it's not installed, of course, you'll want to call the installation there. And then, like I said, um, we're going to be using this seizures data, which uh, is, again, available on the course website. So I'm just going to load that in. Um, and the first thing to note about this data is that it's actually in wide format. Now, I didn't explicitly say this last time, but uh, the GEE GLM function requires your data to be in long format. Okay, so the first thing we're going to want to do is transform this to be in long format, right? So we can call reshape on this. Uh, we're going to pass in our data as seizures. We want to pass in a varying variable, and this is just going to be a list of all of the variables that vary. And so in this case, we're going to have our outcomes, which is the number of seizures, the counts of seizures as Y0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And then also we have offset terms. So that's going to be, say, offset 0, offset 1, offset 2, offset 3, offset 4. Okay, so those are all of our time varying variates, uh, columns in, in the uh, data frame here. We're going to specify the separator to be a uh, blank string because here we want the values to be y and then the time is 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And same thing, offset time is 0, uh, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay, so there's no separator that we use. We want to transition to a direction of long and we want the id var is stored as id in this data frame. So I can run this and uh, I should specify this as the string id and run that again. And you can see that we have this seizures long data frame now. Okay, so the word of warning I gave in the last video, and it's actually going to matter here, is that we need to sort the data first by the ID and then by the time index. Okay, so you can see here, we actually have ID one, two, three, four, five, six, all of them at time zero. That's gonna be the default way that reshape sort of transitions our data. That's not gonna work for GEE GLM. So what we're going to want to do is redefine this uh, seizures long to be uh, seizures long. And again, we use this order function. We're going to order by first the ID, so seizures long ID, and then seizures long, and it's called time. Okay, and that's just going to reorder our data set so that now if we look at the head, you can see all of the ID ones are first where it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 for the time. Okay, so if we were going to be fitting this data, I would suggest that we actually take a look at a plot of the data as well. And so, um, you know, I could, you, you could pull in a standard sort of lattice XY plot. I actually have this code copied uh, here, which is essentially the same plot we were using last time, where we're going to plot the outcome, which is stored as Y, right, from these Y0 variables uh, described by time. And then we're storing this inside of, uh, we're plotting this in panels based on the treatment. Uh, the groups are IDs, the data frame is the seizures long data frame. And then again, we have these two different panel plots that we're doing. So we're using an XY plot just to get all of our points there. And then we're using this line join function, which I had some trouble in the last lecture, uh, remembering exactly the, 
the syntax for. Um, but so that's going to then take in uh, this. So again, you don't actually need to to know this, but I would you know play around with this xy plot function a little bit if you want. And running that, we should get this xy plot. And so you can see that we have these two groups. So the treatment is going to be a one if they are on the new experimental drug, and a zero if they're on sort of the old uh, placebo drug. I think it's placebo in this trial. And the idea is we want to test whether this new drug is actually sort of better than the old drug, right? Um, now, there's one sort of odd part about this data, and we can see it in this experimental group right here. And there's these observations that appear way above everyone else, right? So in the first week or so, these, these are counts of the number of seizures. That's what our outcome is. And uh, at time zero, it was over an eight-week period. So that was before treatment started. And then every other time, it's over two-week intervals. So this is the number of seizures over the first eight-week interval, and then over the next two weeks, and then over the next two weeks, and the next two weeks, and so on. And so there's this one patient that during the baseline time had roughly 150 seizures, right? And then throughout the rest of the data uh, was well above everyone else in sort of the category. All right, the only other observation that looks sort of even remotely, there's a few at the baseline here, but after treatment has started in, in the two week period, there's only this, this one observation that sort of stands out. And so we're actually going to exclude that data point as an outlier, okay? Uh, and it turns out that that's ID number 49. And so what I wanna do is I'm just going to say, uh, the seizures long data frame is seizures long, which, uh, and then we just want to take all of the rows such that the ID is not equal to 49, okay? And that's just gonna remove 49. Now, I feel a little bit strange about removing an outlier from this data. I tend to dislike outlier removal in statistical analyses because generally speaking, um, we're going to find that you know outliers are just removed for convenience. And in this case, what I would say is that if there was a medical reason why this person might have been different, then maybe there's some justification for it. My justification is just that it's gonna give us better models to work with as examples. But I do wanna sort of hammer home the point that when you're actually working with real data in the real world, please be careful about removing outliers. Uh, there's probably never really a time that something is truly an outlier. It's probably just that your model's not sort of accommodating for all of the structure possibly. But again, in, in this case, this is just gonna let us get sort of more reasonable to interpret um, models. Okay, so we've plotted the data, we've sorted it, we've removed the outlier that appears to be there. So now the question is sort of like, can we model it, right? And in order to model it, there's sort of uh, a few steps that we're generally going to take. And so the idea for me is first, we're gonna try and pick out which correlation structure makes the most sense for these data. And then after we pick out which correlation structure, I have a set of questions that I'll pull in here and we're gonna sort of use models to go through and answer them. But in order to pick the correlation structure, we have to decide on sort of a base model, okay? And so, um, you know, the, the main correlation structures that we're going to sort of care about are going to be unstructured, exchangeable, or autoregressive, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fit a, uh, a model for each of these, right? And so we've seen it's going to use the GEGLM. The uh, formula, we're going to want to say Y is our outcome here. Now, remember when we're fitting, because this is count data, um, and the count data is going to be sort of the number of occurrences over a period of time, right? And so we actually need an offset term included in the model because at time zero, the number of days or <clears throat> the number of weeks that were being observed were eight. It was over eight weeks. And then for every other observation, it's over a two week period, right? And so we'd expect there to be a lot more observations in the baseline than we would for the rest of it, uh, even if there's no sort of uh, effect of treatment because you know you're observing four times as long and so the way you accommodate this is you take the offset and then we want the log offset so it's the log of uh, the term is called offset right and so it's going to be whatever the uh, term is called here <clears throat> and then let's just say we fit age crossed with treatment crossed with as factor the time right so this is sort of a fully saturated model and the idea is we're going to start with a really large model pick out our correlation structure, and then use models to answer questions that are of interest to us. The data is going to be our seizures long data frame. 
The family that we want to fit is Poisson, just like you'd specify for a GLM. The ID is going to be the ID variable, and the correlation structure for this first one is going to be unstructured. So another little hint here is you can type out the full unstructured uh, string here, but you can also just type out the first few letters uh, to specify it. So that's going to save you a little bit of time if you're doing a bunch of model fitting here. Uh, we're going to copy this and fit the exact same model, except making the exchangeable assumption. So same thing works by specifying just X C H there. And then let's also fit an AR1 model where we specify AR1, right? So if I run this, hopefully there's no typos, that model fit, the exchangeable model fit, the AR1 fit as well. And now what we can do is we can take a look at the QICs, right? So we saw in the previous video that by specifying the QIC, <clears throat> we can actually um, sort of choose models between some alternatives. So I'm going to C bind these to make them look a little bit nicer, but we can take the QIC for each of those models, we can output that, and you can see that we have this table here where the first model is the unstructured, the second one is the exchangeable, the third one is the AR1. And we're looking at this column of QIC or this column of CIC um, because we're comparing correlation structures. If we were comparing mean structured, we'd look at QICU. Right? And so we look across these rows and we're looking for the smallest values. It's easier to see with CIC, I think, because we have 27, 25.1, and then 16.7. So that's the exchangeable correlation structure. And then same thing, actually, if we were to look at the QIC, you have negative 11,290, negative 11,312, negative 11,287. And so this exchangeable structure appears to work best. And so we're going to say, you know, take the correlation to be exchangeable. All right, and now what we want to do is use this modeling to answer a bunch of different questions. Okay, so I'm actually going to copy in some questions here that I have typed out. And um, you can say, uh, let's space these down. So the first one that we want to answer is what is the relative rate in the placebo group post versus pre treatment? Okay, so remember that when we're fitting count data, we're fitting Poisson models with a log link, we interpret the coefficients to be related to the rates of occurrence, okay? And so the relative rate is going to be sort of that ratio of rates between the two different groups. So again, if you're not recalling what relative rates are, I'd encourage you to review your GLM material. But so the first one that we wanna know is if we're comparing just in the placebo group, so just where treatment equals zero, post versus pre-treatment, what is that relative rate? So the first thing that we're going to need to do is actually specify a post versus pre-treatment variable. And so what we mean by that is at time zero, none of them had received any treatment. And then at time one, two, three, and four, they're now sort of post having received the treatment. And so what I'll do is I'm going to do a seizures long post, and I'm going to say that this is going to be a numeric variable. And all we want it to be is if the time is not equal to zero, then we're saying that they're post treatment. Oh, seizures time. That's not... Uh, this is seizures long, the time variable, okay? And so now what you would find is if we just look at the head of seizures long again, that um, whenever time is zero, we get post as zero, but otherwise post is going to be one, okay? So now this variable is going to let us compare uh, pre and post treatment, and that's sort of going to be how we think about the time effects for this model, okay? So if we just want what's the relative rate, the only time effect is pre versus post treatments. We're sort of lumping that uh, together, post treatment. Then we could fit this first model, and we're going to say that it's the GGLM. Uh, we're going to fit it with the offset of the log offset term. And what we want to do is we want to take the model that has the treatment interacting with post, right? Because we want to know in the placebo group, pre versus post. If we just wanted to know is pre versus post across the whole sample one, uh, we could drop this treatment interaction, but we want to know specifically for the placebo group. And we specify the family as the Poisson. We specify the data as seizures long. We specify the ID as ID. And the correlation structure that we picked out was exchangeable. Okay, so we could fit this model. And we could actually take a look at the summary of the model itself just to see what's going on here. Scroll up to these coefficients that we have. And you can see that we have our intercept, our treatment, our post, and then our treatment interacting with post. Okay. And so if you think about what this question is actually asking us, if you think about two different observations, the first is someone in the placebo group pre-treatment. Okay. So we'll say placebo pre-treatment. Well, they're going to have, uh, and if we 
pull this up and some move it down a little bit. They're going to have an intercept term, which is beta zero. They're not going to have this treatment term because their treatment is zero. They're not going to have this post term because it's pre-treatment and they're not going to have the interaction, obviously. Now, if you'd have someone who's in a placebo and is post treatment, well, they're going to have the beta zero still. Um, the treatment is still zero because they're in the placebo group, but they have this post indicator. So that's going to be say beta zero, beta one, beta two, right? And so the relative rate, because we're actually looking at sort of the log of the rate is going to be equal to that. And the log of the rate is going to be equal to that, right? And so then if we take the difference between these two, then what we would find is that the uh, log of the rate, we'll say this is rate two, this is rate one, log of rate two uh, minus log of rate one is equal to beta two, right? And so then if you take the exponential of beta two, that gives you the relative rate between these two groups, right? So just as the quick refresher from GLM, again, that should all be review for you all. But what that means is that this beta two term is the term that we care about. And we could quickly take a peek at the Wald statistic here, right? And this beta two term, we find that it's not significant, 0.335. Now, of course, we could also compute that uh, value directly ourselves. And maybe I'll show you how to do that just briefly here, right? So we're saying that the relative rate is the exponential of the coef from model one, and we want this post coefficient, okay? Um, oh, model one, sorry. And so we can say that the relative rate is 1.12. So there's, we're saying that there's this observation of there being about 12% higher um, rate, right? But then we want to test, is that significantly different from zero? We could define the um, Z statistic here to be equal to the ratio between the estimated coefficient uh, divided by its standard error. So that's coef of model one, post divided by uh, the square root of the diagonal of the VCOV. Remember, VCOV gives us the variance covariance matrix here uh, of model one. And we want to take the diagonal of that. So that's just extracting the diagonal elements, which contain the variance. And we want that for post. Uh, oh, VCOV. Now we get Z. And you can see that if we go back to the summary for model one, um, that actually we're sort of just uh, doing this ratio of 0.112 divided by the standard error that was estimated here of, I believe, 0.116, right? And so you get that 0.966, uh, Z slightly different because of rounding, but you know, that's, that's all we're computing there. And uh, if we want to test whether this is significantly different from zero, then our p-value is going to be twice, um, one minus the p-norm of uh, our z value here. And you can see the p-value 0.335, which is exactly the p-value reported in our summary table. And so we would conclude that, no, there is no reason to reject the null hypothesis that this relative rate is no different uh, than one. And so there's sort of no difference in the rates pre and post treatment in the placebo group. Okay, so that answers that first question. Is there a difference in pre versus post relative rates between the two treatment terms? Okay. So what are we really asking here? Well, we've already seen the relative rate for the placebo group, right? So let's think about what it would be in the treatment. So if you have treatment, but you're pre-treatment, well, we're going to be beta zero. And that beta one term gave us that treatment indicator, OK? And so then if you have treatment post-treatment, then you have beta zero plus beta one. Now, beta two was for being post-treatment, and beta three was their interaction term. And so then the difference between those two is going to be beta two plus beta three. And so we could actually compute the relative rate uh, for these for the treatment group uh, pre versus post treatment is going to be the exp of um, the coef of the model one. And we want um, post is going to be beta two. And then their interaction term is going to be treatment crossed with post. Right? And instead of just taking those, we actually want to sum up those coefficients. Right, So that's going to give us uh, the relative rate. Oh, I forgot to include my vector here. So that should be the vector of those two. Select, we can see that we get a relative rate of 0.827. Right? So there's actually some sort of treatment benefit. Treatment seems to be reducing 
them. And the question at hand is, is this relative rate significantly different from the relative rate we computed up here, right? And so we want to test, uh, is, you know, uh, RR2 significantly different from RR1? Well, the way that we could test this is testing whether B3 is equal to zero, right? Because if B3 is equal to zero, then the relative rate in both groups is just B2. And so this becomes a test of H0 uh, B3 equals zero, beta three equals zero. So instead of going through this whole process of computing the, uh, the statistic directly, instead what we could do is we could just come here and we could peek at the summary of model one. And if we go to beta three, that's this interaction term here, you can see we have our walled value, which again is a chi-squared walled value. Uh, and you can see that the probability, the p-value is 0.077. And so at a 5% significance level, we wouldn't reject uh, the null hypothesis. At a 10%, we would. And so there might be some evidence that they're different between these two groups, but it's not substantially strong evidence. Okay, so, uh, you know, you can, again, make that informed decision there, but that's a p-value of about 8%. All right, so that's the second question we wanted to ask. So the third one is, is there a treatment effect on the rates of seizures overall, okay? So to specify, what we're asking is, does treatment matter in this model, okay? And so um, essentially what that is, is if you think about our, our model that we've fit here, right? If treatment does not matter, then we should find that beta one and beta three are no different from zero, right? Because if we could just drop those from the model, then we should be able to test beta one equals beta three equals beta zero, or equals zero, sorry. B1 equals B3 equals zero. And so there are sort of two ways that we can think about uh, fitting this, right? So the first way is to use a walled test directly, right, where we define an L matrix, and we saw an example of this in the last lecture, and you're gonna select out beta one, you're gonna select out beta three, and then you're going to go from there. The other way, and I wanna show this to you because it sort of is a little bit strange, um, is that we can actually fit the reduced model. So if I say model one reduced, uh, and we can use the update command, it's a favorite of mine. So we say update model one, and we just want to specify a new formula. This time it's going to be the offset of the log offset, and we drop the treatment here. So that's just going to be plus post, right? So that's a reduced model. And here, what we can actually do is call ANOVA between model one and model one reduced. Okay, now in general, the ANOVA command is going to perform a likelihood ratio test. However, it is smart enough to know that we're using non-likelihood based procedures here. And so instead of doing a likelihood ratio test when we pass in these GEE objects, it's going to perform a walled test. Um, and so if we run that, you can see that we get slightly different output than what you might uh, use. It tells you right here, we're using the walled statistic and it computes the um, chi-squared value and then the p-value is 0.16. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Um, beta one equals beta three equals beta zero. And so uh, we you know, don't reject the null that there is no treatment effect, right? So that's sort of how we would conclude there. Um, so now we've tested sort of these relative rates. We've seen that there might be a little bit of a difference between the two different groups uh, with the rates pre and post treatment but that overall treatment doesn't seem to actually matter in the model, okay? And so is there evidence of overdispersion? So remember that overdispersion occurs in count data when our variance is larger than our mean. And the way that we accommodate for that is by including that scale parameter, it's that phi, right? So our variance that we're estimating is phi times by uh, the mean. And so if we'd actually take a look at the summary output of our model, right, so I'll go summary, uh, say model one, you can see that down after our coefficients, we see the correlation structure is exchangeable, estimated scale parameter, estimated correlation parameters. So in the estimated scale parameter, you can see that we have this estimate of 10.4 with a standard error of 2.28. So this is the phi parameter, the standard error for the phi parameter. Now, if um, we have a uh, phi parameter equal to one, then that means there's no over dispersion. If the phi parameter is less than one, then that means that there's under dispersion in the data. And if the phi parameter is greater than one, 
well, then there's over dispersion. And uh, we're estimating that there's about 10 times as much variation in the data as the standard Poisson model would predict. And it's highly significant, right? The standard error is 2.28. So that's, you know, whatever, uh, four and a half standard errors above uh, one. And so we're going to conclude that that is certainly significantly different. You don't have to perform a hypothesis test. It's large enough. Uh, so yes, there is substantial evidence of over dispersion. So the second last question that we're answering here is what is the estimated correlation? And again, we just go back to the uh, estimated correlation parameters. And so we'd find that the estimated correlation is 0.598. Now remember, we're using the exchangeable assumption. And so we just get one estimated correlation parameter. So it's about 0.6. And again, we get a standard error estimate on here if we wanted to sort of uh, you know, contain that in a confidence interval. For instance, we could do that. Um, but so that's just output from the model. Now the last question, so I'll just fill in the answer here. So that's going to be 0 0.598 with a standard error uh, equal to 0 0.0811, I think. Okay. Now my last question is, does baseline age change any of this, right? So if I actually view the data, if I go view of uh, seizures long, you can see that we have this age factor. And so that's how old the person was when the study started. And the question is, we've just answered a bunch of, you know, uh, questions here. If we had included age in the model, would any of these conclusions have been different? So you can think about fitting a second model, model two. And here we're going to specify the formula is y, which is the offset log of the offset, right? We want treatment cross post, and then say that we also want the interactions between treatment and age and age and post. Okay. Specify the family to be Poisson. Specify the data to be seizures long. The ID is going to be ID. And the core structure will still assume that the first one that we were using is correct, which is the exchangeable, right? And so this model here includes baseline age as a factor. All right. And so we're actually going to be sort of including a few extra parameters in the model, right? So if I go summary of model two, Model two here, Oops. summary model two, there we go. Uh, you can see that we've estimated quite a few extra parameters here. So we have the intercept, the treatment, the post. Now a made effective age, we have the treatment with the post, the treatment with the age, and the post with the age as well. And if we just scroll down, we can see that the uh, post with the age appears to be significant, right? So pre post treatment seems to matter based on the age. Uh, the age by itself doesn't seem to matter so much, nor does the treatment with the age. Um, and so, you know, we might think about actually sort of reducing this model a little bit if we wanted to, uh, where maybe we want to drop this treatment age interaction or whatever. Um, but for now, I will just, uh, uh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe we will actually fit that model. Why don't we actually fit that model? So we'll say model two reduced is going to be, and I'll take this here and, uh, We'll keep the treatment or the age and the post, but we'll drop this treatment and the age, okay? And so now post is going to interact with both treatment and age, but they don't interact with one another. And um, we could do a test on this, or we could look at the QIC values, for instance. So if I go QIC model two and uh, QIC model two reduced, remember they have the same correlation structure. So we're comparing these QIC use here, and we would like the smaller one. Uh, and so in this case, the reduced model might not be acceptable. Um, of course, we could also actually do sort of an ANOVA, um, an ANOVA difference as well here, but, uh, you know, depends on, depends on exactly what you want to do. That's up to you. This whole model selection process is, uh, sort of, you know, it's, it's more of an art than a science as they would say. Um, and so. You know, if you actually were to run the ANOVA comparing the model two with model two reduced, uh, then you can see the p-value, uh, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And so, you know, perhaps the, the reduced model is better. Let's work with the reduced model, right? But again, you'd want to justify why this is and the specific situation is going to indicate which model you want to work with. For now, I'll value parsimony over uh, the fit. Okay. And so the idea would be, we want to go back through and answer all of these questions again, except now where we've controlled for age. And so 
one note is that if we're looking at the uh, relative rates, for instance, we have to specify that these are relative rates for a fixed age, right? Because if you think about it, um, the individual who is in the placebo group, who is pre-treatment, say, uh, above, we said they were beta zero, but now they're actually going to be beta zero. And then I think it should be beta three times by their age, right? So if I go summary of model two reduced, right, they're going to have uh, beta zero. They won't have beta one. They won't have beta two if they're in the pre-group, but they will have beta three times age. And then uh, when they're pre or post-treatment, they'll be beta zero plus beta two plus beta three times age. Right? And so if their age is the same, then these factors will all cancel out and you'll be left with beta two once again. Right? So you have to make sure that all of these conclusions are for patients of the same age. But we can look at the summary and we can test that first question, is there a uh, significant difference pre post treatment in the placebo group that comes down to testing whether beta two is different from zero, right? So that's post right here. And we can see that actually uh, now we have this 0.043 value, right? So that is actually significant. So the answer to the first question changes whether you include baseline age or not, right? Um, now, do the rates differ between the two different groups? Again, that came down to testing whether treatment and post, uh, whether this interaction was significant. And you can see that again, we're at a value that's significant at a 10% level, not at a 5% level, right? And so um, you could go through, answer all of those questions again, and I'd advise you to, to sort of do that and convince yourselves of it. But uh, the point is that even that first question does change, right? So by including that extra parameter, by including age in our model, uh, we're gonna be getting different results. And so, you know, I'd encourage you to start playing around with all of this, but that does, you know, sort of show uh, how we might be able to go answer some, some scientific questions, you know, about placebo groups versus treatment groups. Um, and also it shows sort of the importance of specifying a model that works, right? Because by including this extra explanatory factor here, now suddenly we're getting different results. And so you'd wanna be careful about how you're interpreting uh, sort of all of those results as you go on. Now, uh, again, all of this code will be posted on the course website alongside the data uh, for both of these two examples. And there's other data sets there too. So I'd encourage you to play around with those and sort of get a feel for how this GEE pack works. In the next lecture, we're actually gonna start talking about a different type of model to fit to longitudinal data. And so, you know, we're sort of gonna wrap up marginal models and then move on to, to other uh, interesting models. And so if there's any questions about this or about anything related to marginal models, I'd encourage you to reach out and ask me. And otherwise, I will see you in the next lecture video.